Hello everyone, this is the first recording for a class on early Greek philosophy. I want to talk about the metaphysics of flux, a famous Greek view according to which everything is in multiple ways in motion. This view is typically ascribed to Heraclitus, a philosopher whom we will study later on in the semester, but Cato, in his dialogue The Theaetetus, associates it also with Homer, the poet to whom the Iliad and the Odyssey are ascribed. And I want to talk a little bit about this because it will turn out that it has implications for how we conceive of the beginnings of Greek philosophy. So what is it that the metaphysics of flux says, according to this passage in Plato's Theaetetus, which is 152? There are no stable objects with stable properties. Instead, everything is in motion, movement, and mixture, to the effect that nothing ever is, but everything always becomes. So this is a view that Plato ascribes to Homer, and I want to ask why should that interest us? After all, Homer is a poet. Now, here's a kind of contrasting picture of the beginnings of Greek philosophy, and the reason I'm looking at this passage in Plato is really to say, you know, why should we possibly or quite likely depart from a traditional way of conceiving of the beginnings of Greek philosophy. The traditional way of looking at things is to say that the early Greek philosophers are what we may call natural philosophers. And what does that mean? That means that they study nature, that they are something like, you know, early scientists. And here's a cartoon version of this view, which is a view that has been around for a long time and which has been presented almost in a kind of celebratory way at times. There's on the one hand traditional Greek poetry, and that is traditional insofar as the universe is as it were shaped by divinity. The heavens are the place where Zeus is around, and then there's the earth, and there's Hades, and there's Poseidon, and the ocean, and so on and so forth. So, you know, the gods are agents in all of those domains of the universe. And now, all of a sudden, here are the philosophers, and they talk about elements, and they talk about matter, and they talk about causation. And it looks as if they are ancestors of today's scientists, today's, you know, cosmologists, people in physics, and so on and so forth. And that is an exciting story. It is, however, a story that is no longer accepted. And that has a number of implications and dimensions to it. And it is a story that has been refuted from a number of perspectives. What goes along typically with the story is that Thales from Miletus is presumably the first Greek philosopher and as this is at times even put, the first philosopher as it were to cool. Not just the first Greek philosopher, that is, but the first philosopher. And that view, as you can imagine, is incredibly contested. To the effect that no one at this point in the field accepts it, I would say. So here's one way of calling this view into question, and that is the way that has been discussed by Leah. Cantor in a 2022 paper. The most direct and immediate and maybe even the most simple way of calling this into question is just to ask, what do Plato and Aristotle think about the beginnings of Greek philosophy? Well, they think that the Greeks somehow inherit philosophy from Egypt, and they think that philosophy comes from Egypt. And then there are other sources which speak of ancient Mesopotamia and ancient India, and so on. So it is by no means to be assumed that philosophy comes from Greece, but it is kind of furthermore contested that within Greece, Thales is the first philosopher. And if the passage that I started out with about Homer defending or, you know, being associated with something like a metaphysics of flux, is trustworthy, 
that would be plainly false. Now, how can we think about this? And one way we can think about it is to say that Thales might be first or distinctive of a certain way of doing natural philosophy. But natural philosophy does not exhaust what the early Greek philosophers did. And to say that is a kind of shift in how we approach early Greek philosophy. A lot of introductions to so-called pre-Socratic philosophy, which is a term that is typically used, and I use the term early Greek philosophy, in order to get away from some of the associations, as it were, with the term pre-Socratic philosophy. So a lot of introductions to pre-Socratic philosophy are going to tell you that, well, it is sort of mostly natural philosophy and Thales is the beginning of it. Now, let's return to the Theaetetus and ask how Plato would see this. So he ascribes this metaphysical view to Homer and he says that Homer leads an army of thinkers who hold the metaphysics of flux and this army includes Protagoras, the relativist and sophist Protagoras, it includes Heraclitus and includes others. But then later on in the dialogue, Plato also mentions Thales. He mentions him in a famous anecdote. In this story, a servant walks along and encounters Thales in an empty well. So the servant is amused. She thinks that Thales is this head-in-the-clouds philosopher who fell into the well. You know, this kind of philosopher who doesn't even look ahead of them and just steps into the well. Now, a lot of readers of the Theaetetus, including specialists and scholars, have thought that that is possibly the right reading. And Plato might, for a moment, make fun of philosophers. And that is not entirely far-fetched insofar as Plato certainly does not think that sense perception is the focus of philosophers. Nevertheless, it is not a compelling reading. That has been demonstrated by Friedemann Budensee in a 2014 paper. He looks at methods in ancient astronomy and cosmology, and that is sort of where we can put Thales. Thales, most likely, was in this empty well, using it as something like a telescope and as a tool for measuring the movements of celestial bodies. So he climbed down there intentionally in order to do something that is kind of important to his own field of research to understand the movements of the stars. Now, if we think that that is how Plato views Thales, then we might ask, how does it sort of all fit together? What kind of starting point can we take away from the sorts of things that I've been talking about for our class in early Greek philosophy? And I want to suggest that we can take away that Plato would argue that something like metaphysics is maybe even older than natural philosophy cosmology, astronomy, what Thales does. And then he even mentions, so Plato mentions sort of in the context of talking about Homer, he mentions Protagoras. And we may think, well, we may also think of Protagoras and his kinds of concerns as related to early Greek thought. And so we might end up thinking that we need a much more kind of varied conception of early Greek thought, not the conception according to which it essentially is natural philosophy, but rather a conception that permits for a kind of number of subfields, as it were, natural philosophy, metaphysics, epistemology, and so on. And that also calls into question this idea that the philosophers, as it were, turn away from the poets like Homer as if the poets like Homer were, as it were, merely traditionalists. Perhaps these earlier authors can also be viewed as reflecting upon or somehow mentioning views of the universe, of reality, and so on, that are philosophically interesting. 